Good afternoon, everybody. You have met all the nine candidates we know of now. It has been a very interesting week. I think we have to commend the candidates having answered altogether some 800 questions by the membership and some additional ones from several, some from civil society. Uh, I think also that there is good reason both to thank the candidates for showing up and patiently responding to an overwhelming lot of questions, but also to the general membership of the United Nations taking so massively part in this discussion. I think almost every country has been present at least most of the time uh, in, in this in, 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 in informal dialogue. And my impression is, of course, my experience is short, but during the month I've been here, we never had that frank and substantial a discussion about the future of the United Nations uh, as the one we got during these uh, informal dialogues. Uh, we have talked about the virtues, we have talked about the flaws of, of the UN, and the candidates have presented a lot of interesting views of how to do things even better. Uh, we also had to remember that what is going on within these walls these past three days and probably also some days uh, later on because more candidates will be coming uh, and going through the same procedure is only part of this process of transparency. An important part, a starting point, but what is going on is a much, much broader discussion around the world about this, engaging a large number of people, uh, engaging, of course, in particular, uh, a number of civil society organizations, among which we all remember, of course, the one for seven billion uh, as a driving force in this. What we know is that during these days, 227,000 people from 209 different countries and territories have looked into this discussion on the website, which is, I think, trend-making in a way about transparency in the UN system. So I am I'm very uh, ins inspired about this. Of course, some will say, will it do make a difference? I think some of you asked the same question already before we started. Uh, I can only repeat uh, a version of what I said then. Uh, it has already made a difference. We have established a new standard of transparency and inclusivity for the selection and the appointment process. Uh, uh, but it has all the potential also to influence the final outcome of the selection of the Secretary General. So I think uh, it has been a very interesting three days. Uh, I hope you share that view, and I hope that you will be part of the wider extension of this discussion about the future of the UN, about the candidates, uh, following up on many of the questions which it was physically impossible for the candidates to ask in depth in this process we have organized, but they will be present with those questions in the following days, weeks, and months. Any questions? Thank you, Mr. President. Sherwin Bryce, B, South African Broadcasting. I think all the candidates, when they came out here, spoke about how they welcomed this open uh, process, the ability to engage. And I think from the level of participation we've seen from member states, there's great enthusiasm for the General Assembly to, to have an impact on the decision of the Security Council. Why then not make this impact real? Why not have a straw poll in the General Assembly to really inform the discussion that will essentially happen behind closed doors? 
Yes, it's an interesting suggestion. Uh, I cannot tell you what kind of conclusions the General Assembly will, will take on this, but, but of course it's possible for countries to present their opinions on a list, for instance, so that we have a kind of, of, of impression of the views in the General Assembly. I think it will certainly be all too early to try to exercise things like that, that would be wise, but I certainly will not go in the forefront. Now, member countries themselves have to discuss how they will use this new process. Ah, yes. Mr. President, Evelyn Leopold, um, you must be exhausted by now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> it, it felt often like 193 countries were questioning one candidate, which means the answers by their very nature had to, most of them had to be superficial. They gave longer answers out here often than they could in the, in the uh, trusteeship council. Was there any other way to do it, or do you think people learned enough about each candidate with that kind of quick jumping around? Well, when you have a time slot of two hours, it's a difficult balance between giving every member state and part of the civil society access to ask questions and at the same time demand in-depth answers to all the questions. But on the other hand, if you, if you uh, look through these discussions, I mean, a number of questions came back in new versions. So I, I, I think actually that it was possible to get an impression on uh, uh, the basic uh, ideas, viewpoints of, of, of each and every candidate. But as I said just a moment ago, I consider this only the framework within these walls. It will be followed up by you, by the candidates, out in the open, in the world, uh, public opinion, in meetings, discussions, panel uh, discussions, both in New York and elsewhere, uh, in, in this exciting process. So we will get the answers before the member countries have to decide which preference they have. Mr. President, uh, Edith Lettera from the Associated Press. Following on Sherwin's uh, question, just a quick follow-up. Um, you said that it would be up to the member states to um, decide on any, any follow-up or a straw poll. But as president, isn't that an initiative that you yourself could take in just suggesting it? Um, my, question, my question is, you talked about the fact that it, since you came, this was the most interesting discussion you'd heard on the future and the strengths and the shortcomings of the United Nations. What were your takeaways after listening to all of these candidates on the strengths and the shortcomings? of the United, Na United Nations. No candidates, just, just the, the issues. Yeah. I think it's obvious and very much also the common opinion of candidates that yes, we have done some uh, great steps forward with the sustainable development and the climate agreement with, with uh, maybe also we can include progress on Iran and uh, maybe in Syria in, in strengthening of multilateralism finally where it was most needed. Uh, but, but that we need a lot of implementation. We need a lot more of proactive intervention to avoid conflicts and contain conflicts. We, we need a, an even stronger network to uh, uh, monitor human rights violations and uh, uh, deal with them. We need uh, some kind of uh, reform of the bureaucracy or the organizational structure uh, of, of this organization so that it can better deal with the more holistic views of, 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 of the sustainable development. I, all these 
issues were raised in one way or another at every uh, session of the inf informal dialogues, and that's very obviously because those are the basic issues about the future of the United Nations. And, and as a force, uh, hopefully there is this dynamism in, in the process that because member countries, including the, the big ones, recognize the need of common action, they will also be interested in supporting a strong uh, and independent next Secretary General as well. Uh, hi, Dulcie Leinbach with Pass Blue. I was wondering, uh, do you have any indication of another round of hearings with different candidates? Will you uh, think about changing the format in any way uh, in terms of limiting the number of questions asked by certain groups? And what, were, what surprised you, what disappointed you about this round of hearings? Well, I was surprised by the large turnout of member states and group of member states asking questions. Uh, that was uh, more than I expected, actually, but that's a part of the, the whole enthusiasm uh, with the process. I think it would be unfair to try to change the process now. Uh, uh, we have been through nine candidates, and, and the, those who may come afterwards will go through the same kind of process, with the li limitations uh, uh, connected with that, but as I said to your colleague, also with the possibility of following up outside these halls. Uh, I, I forgot to answer if I should take an initiative myself uh, on, on, on counting the votes. Uh, I don't think it's what anyone has asked me for up till now. And I think we are in the process of things developing more rapidly and more powerful than many people expected. So we'll see what happens. Do you have disappointments? Was there anything that you felt, um, any disappointments about the process or anything lacking that you would have liked to have seen? No, I think it was, it was encouraging also in the way that all the nine candidates have strong experience from national governments, some of them even being uh, prime ministers, strong experience for national governments and strong experience with the United Nations. And, and, and with all that, of course, also goes a lot of administrative experience. And that's exactly what we need. So that was encouraging. Uh, and what was maybe not totally satisfying was the, was the limitations of, of time and, and depth in the discussion. But I don't think we can make it much different if we don't want to have four-hour sessions instead of two-hour sessions with each candidate. I don't think that that's possible within, uh, <laughs> within the, the time frame we are operating here. Are there going to be another round, another round of hearings with, you with all the candidates? Potential, no, other candidates. With, with a new, uh, yes, you know of yes candidates certainly. Coming? Certainly. I, I mean, uh, uh, what I said at the end, and you may not have heard it because you were out here, I said we urge now every country and every candidate that must, must be on their way to come forward and come forward quickly so that we can have the same kind of procedure with them as quickly as possible. Hopefully Kevin Rudd hears you. But I wanted to ask you about financial disclosure that, that I'd asked you about before this. And, and, and in a way, thanks for having these stakeouts. A number of the candidates themselves said, you know, 60,000 60, euros, what Mr. Karim said, Daniel, Daniel Turk said there's 40,000 from his government. But do you think this should be standardized in some way? It should the, some other candidates either haven't answered the question or, or, or not. It seems like it's an e Vuk Yeramic said that he's going to fundraise from non-governments and try to disclose. I'm not sure in what format. I don't know if you, I guess I just, I'm asking you, do you have any thoughts on that issue? It seems like some did disclose, some didn't. Yeah. Should, in the future, what should happen? I think disclosure will be good, and I, I guess you folks have asked those questions. I think in no election, wherever in the world, and whichever organization, you cannot be sure that everybody has the same amount of support, not uh, uh, of any kind, not in money either. So, so we can't make regulations about that, but, but disclosure would be good.
But as I said already on, on, on Tuesday, I think uh, it's very much uh, a question for you to deal with, with the candidates, and when there are candidates from UN organizations, it's for the UN organizations also to deal with the, the candidates, not for me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice evening.